Hi, here's uh, Michael Leander for my very first Google Hangout and I decided to make the first one a good one and for that reason I have invited a uh, speaker colleague and the person who's become a good friend whom I initially met oddly enough in Iran, in Tehran where both of us were speaking at a conference and later we managed to do some events together in his home country which is in South Africa. Uh, his name is Jacques de Villa and uh, apart from being a very experienced sales trainer uh, he's also somebody who knows quite a lot about the whole area of uh, lead acquisition and lead conversion and uh, lead management. So I asked him here to uh, to pick his brain, and uh, I hope that we'll uh, we'll have a good conversation here. And you're welcome if you're watching this live. You're welcome to uh, to butt in. So welcome to you, Shaq. Thank you, Michael. It's really great speaking to you all the way from South Africa, and it's just amazing this technology that we can use this Google Hangout. And as you say, this is our first one, so hopefully it goes really well. Just to give you a bit of background on myself, I'm a speaker and trainer and consultant, and I'm really in the sales game. That that is my main field. And what I found, particularly in South Africa and probably everywhere else in the world, one of the biggest challenges that salespeople have or companies have is lead generation. But Michael, you're running the session, so why don't you get the ball rolling and then I'll chip in where I can. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Jack. Uh, so uh, lots of questions, uh, lots of interesting things to, uh, to ask about, but let's start with the problems. Uh, as somebody who has been uh, training lots and lots and lots of salespeople, uh, what is your experience in terms of the quality of leads that sales organizations are getting these days? Uh, can you say anything about that? Uh, absolutely. Look, firstly, from their, their marketing, uh, as you probably know, a lot of leads these days seem to come through the Internet, and those are normally, I suppose, quite good, but you've also got, as they call in the car selling business, tire kickers. So the challenge is getting the right leads, and as you know, a lot of people from all over the world can be hitting your website, so perhaps if you're a localized company, a lead from America would not be, or an interest from America would not be that, would not be valuable at all. You'd want him to be getting one from, from the local, local area. The challenge is that many, many salespeople, I'm talking South Africa specifically, our main lead generation source is still, you know, looking in the telephone book for leads, um, driving around, looking on billboards, you know, to that kind of lead generation. And then it is hitting the telephones, trying to get a hold of the right person. And, and that's where the challenge comes in. Because as you know, with prospecting, it's, <laughs> it's quite difficult to get hold of the right person. Very often the people are, are blocked by the secretaries and they can't get through. The second challenge that I believe we face is that we're very sales management driven, so the sales manager expects a salesperson to produce a certain amount of phone calls a week, and at the end of the week, or they either have a sales meeting on a Friday, or they have a sales meeting on a Monday, and when that happens, let's say, for example, the sales manager wanted the salesperson to phone 50 people that week so they can set up maybe 10 appointments if they're lucky. Because the salesperson wants, I suppose, doesn't want to really get into trouble, wants to look good at the meeting, they will phone practically anybody and say, look, I phoned my 50 people and I got three appointments. But the big problem, as you know, with that is that the leads they're phoning are not qualified. And I think the biggest challenge that we face is getting qualified leads. So that's kind of my take on where we're going with the quality of the leads. So, uh, but I guess this differs a lot from business to business, doesn't it? Uh, you mentioned uh, some type of salespeople who would just, uh, you know, basically pick leads or, or rather names, not even leads, names uh, randomly, uh, and then canvas these leads. And but I suppose on the other end of the spectrum, you have. 
uh, large corporations with a marketing department uh, where they have to deliver leads to to salespeople, right? You have these two different types of Different different types of companies in both ends of the spectrum, right? That that's correct, Michael. Look, once again, I can only speak for South Africa, uh, since that's that's where I play. Marketing departments in the business to business companies, I don't believe have got it yet. Uh, from what I've seen in the big IT companies that I've worked in. The salesperson is still responsible for getting the, the leads, as you want to call them. Oh, wow. Marketing departments, marketing departments, in my opinion, rely very heavily on their websites. And what I've seen in, in some IT companies is that that information that they get from the website, let's say a lead, uh, is is seldom passed on to the to the sales department for the simple reason that. I think both the sales and marketing departments' cultures seem to be different. They don't seem to be on the same page, in my opinion, and they're not working together, so they, they haven't mapped out a strategy. What I have started seeing happening more and more, you don't now have a sales director and a marketing director. In South Africa, I see the folks are now starting to combine the two, so they're calling them a sales and marketing director, mm. and hopefully that will well, that'll answer some of the, the challenges. Um, but I, in my experience, have yet to find a marketing person that gets a salesperson and a salesperson that gets a marketing person. So to find that, that animal to, to marry the two, I think is, is quite a challenge. Um, I always call marketing the sexy part. Uh, you know, the marketing guys live in those ivory towers and the sales guys are hitting the roads. They're the, the foot soldiers really getting hammered. And these two people don't speak to each other. But that's the challenge we face, well, in my opinion, that we face right now, that there isn't, in South Africa, or some of the companies that I've been exposed to, a great lead generation strategy. They're kind of hoping that something happens. They've got an internet presence. The big challenge is trying to get onto number one, or at least the top ten of Google. They're gonna, they hope they're going to get some traction out of that. Um, but in our market, still... Um, the salesperson is is the one that is, I would say, 70% responsible for generating their own needs. And that's old school via the telephone book, via networking, um, via meeting other people and obviously asking for referrals from companies. And also it's not a, in the bigger companies, for example, some IT companies, they only have maybe... 300 possible customers because they, they're high-end, that is not a hard ask. I mean, to get the name of the 300 possible prospects is pretty easy. And within two weeks to a month, if you're a half-decent salesperson, you should be able to at least contact all those people and get them into what we call, as you know, the suspects bucket. They're only the suspects at this stage. You obviously then have to do a bit more investigation to turn them into qualified prospects, and then only do you set up the appointments to go and see them. Exactly, and uh, and maybe uh, if I could just uh, comment and ask more questions here, because you, you did mention uh, this example of a company with a limited number of real potential prospects in their market, and you mentioned that in South Africa, uh, a salesperson or a salespeople will then in turn call each of these 300 and I suppose try to get a meeting or whatnot. But what about the situation where somebody calls somebody with the objective to get a meeting, uh, the person is the right person but doesn't want a meeting right now for whatever reason. Uh, in the old school sales as you just referred to, I think what would have happened is that that person who got a no to the meeting would then sort of schedule to follow up with that person who a decline to have the meeting, let's say, three, six, 12 months down the road, right? That would be the sort uh, of... Uh, that, that, that's great. That's how it would happen. And so I think that that combination that apparently is missing in, uh, in South Africa, and I think it's missing uh, everywhere else in the world, where marketing could help nurture that prospect in order to 
qualify that prospect better and for that prospect to better get to know the company so that it's more likely that he'll take the meeting when he's called back, say, three or six or 12 months later. Don't you think that would be much more effective? Absolutely, Michael. I mean, that is that is the ideal strategy. As old school is exactly how you said it. The guy would schedule another call and say, "Are you still in, are you are you still not interested? Or are you interested? Can I come and see you?" And that was the process. But as you know, we have to start building as marketers the brand, and we have to start building trust. And more and more people want to. Um, I'm just digging for a word here. They they need to find more information because when when you first it's like dating when you first meet somebody you you may buy them a drink and try and get you know talk to the person but there's not enough information for them to make a a decision whether they would want to go out with you and same in the sales situation so this is where I believe marketing departments need to come into their own. They need, as you say, they need to nurture that lead. They need to provide them with case studies, testimonials, recent information, um, and on all they're doing is they're building up that trust. So when the salesperson then does approach the person, the the prospect in three months' time, there's a bit more of a relationship. There's a bit more credibility um, there. I also believe that marketing should. Uh, I can't remember, and you could probably correct me. It was. I think Tom Peters that said, you know, we're like bananas sell us in bunches. Uh, I may have got the wrong end of the stick. But where marketing can really come into its own is to create events where they can invite prospects. So let's say the salesperson has made the first initial contact. Marketing can actually go and invite prospects to a breakfast session where uh, you can get an industry expert to, to give some great information. And that then goes to, I suppose, Caldini's law of reciprocity. You know, the, you've given them a good breakfast. You've given them some amazing information. Hopefully, then they're more amenable to when the salesperson approaches them again to maybe reconsidering their position. Yeah. I don't know what you think, Michael. No, but absolutely. Obviously, this depends a lot on which industry and what type of people you're targeting, and and not the least. Uh, uh, the value, the initial value of a sale, as well as the customer lifetime value. But for you know, you mentioned IT, uh, any type of IT really. I, I I spend a long time in the IT software industry, and uh, in that industry, this is definitely true. Uh, but I think it's also very much about answering questions, and uh, I think it's very much about the prospect being able to take his or her time. To, to research and to understand better what the company is all about, what the product is all about, and all of that. And I think that's where marketing comes in again. So let me ask you this, because I know you're into uh, what they like to refer to as inbound marketing and uh, content marketing, and they have so many uh, new names for something that actually has been around for a very, very long time. And I know you're into writing, and I know you have a blog, and uh, I'm assuming that you have a blog and that you write not just to you know for the for the fun of it, but I'm assuming that's also part of your lead acquisition strategy. What are your thoughts on on all of that? Absolutely, I think this whole, as I say, content marketing has been around. I mean, we're really just giving people information that that they would would need to make a good decision. If we've sexyed it up and called it content marketing, inbound marketing, whatever the case, look. I spoke to a social media guru the other day, and was, almost anyone can become a guru these days. <laughs> um, and but he made a good point. He says if you are expecting ROI on your social media, this is the wrong way to look at it. Which kind of took me aback because you know most of us we don't do things for nothing. We, we have a reason why we're writing, build content, build trust, build credibility. So and hopefully. Ignite something in the prospect that will, they will look at us favorably and buy from us. But he says, look, really, it's about it's about building it's about building trust. And as you know, marketing is it's a it's a rolling landscape. So you never know who's going to be online at the time that your article is there. So in my experience, it's pretty much hit and miss. And what you want to be trying to do is getting conversations going. 
that more people put you on Google and Google plus you and, and you get better rankings in the in the search engines and you probably know as well as I do I believe Google as this week this weekend is changing its algorithms and they seem to be giving more uh, credence to um, authors uh, to that I can't remember the name it's some something to do with the author authority of the authors so that seems to be more be coming to the fore more and we're going to have to start build brands building the brands as authors and as companies but back to your question uh, we had an example about a year ago no almost two years ago there was a lady that was selling sweets or candy as they call them overseas and biscuits to for children but they were very healthy so they didn't have all the MSGs and what have you in it and she wrote well we wrote an article on her behalf and stuck it on a article website called article base and really <laughs> in those days we were just thinking well hopefully it'll give us better rankings but funny enough she lived in a little town called Nelspret which is uh, in the north of South Africa in Pumalanga and uh, for you, it'll be near the Kruger National Park. Okay. <laughs> and she, where all the big, big five are. And she saw this article. A week later, she phoned her local shopping center, or the big one, which is called a spa. It's, it's, it's one of the big shopping center groups in, in South Africa. And she said to them, why are you not stocking this product? Because it's good for the kids, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result, she got her biggest order ever from that shopping center. So what it's showing me is in the old days, and old days is like a year ago or two years ago in internet language, uh, people, you get these SEO experts that write you content, but they don't write content for the reader. They write content with, filled with keywords so that they can attract Google or Bing. And this strategy, I think, and to fail because real people are actually reading your articles as well. So you want to write for the real so you can get ranking. And I think that's where content marketing is going to start changing. They're going to need content specialists that write in the voice of the client, I suppose, for the ear of the customer. Um, and that's the big challenge because it's going to be a challenge in my game because I write copy for people like that. I do not really understand the business of the client that I'm writing for. Yes, I get the, the general gist of it. I go do my research, but I don't have the culture. I haven't grown up in that culture for me, I believe, to write an article that would really resonate with a, with a prospect. So what I'm saying is that companies have to train up their own people to start becoming champions of the whatever product and start writing because they've got the culture, they've got the passion. You know, as a copywriter, I can be passionate about your, your content for a while, but I'm going to move on to another subject, to another totally different industry. And, but the best I can do is, is broad stroke the thing. But somebody that's been in the business for 10 or 20 years and really understands and grasps it and has the passion for it, they can write, I guarantee you, way better than me in terms of what they want to get across. Maybe the grammar and the spelling and diction is not that great, but just getting across what they want to, I believe they can do it better than a copywriter. So my take on it is that companies are going to have to start training their own staff to become champions and become good writers. Where, where they can help their staff is to, I suppose, send them on a writing course so they can just get the, that 10% polish. But generally, if you've got that passion and that, I think it will come out. So that's my opinion on this. On, the, on this whole uh, content inbound uh, marketing. But the interesting thing is that I find, Shaq, uh, reading articles, and obviously a lot of the articles that I read are written by native English speakers, writers, uh, for whom obviously it's, it's a little bit more easy if you're writing in your own language. But I notice that a lot of them are well written and contains good content, but in terms of the whole lead acquisition uh, part, it's not really implemented very well. Uh, so it seems that people still are disconnected a little bit because they're writing, they're spending all of this money uh, to get eyeballs on their messages and to attract, I suppose, a, uh, 
a reader base, uh, a, and eventually a loyal reader base, but they are not really implementing the little the little things they need to implement in order to get these eyeballs to convert to uh, any of the steps uh, of a um, a lead, whether it be to convert to a newsletter, sign up, or convert to a download, or whatever. What's your What's your thought on that? What's you What's your experience? Michael, you're absolutely Pardon? There are two schools of thought in, in this. There's the there's two schools of thought in this. There's the purists who say you should just write content and uh, if it's good enough people will read it and then maybe they'll go to your website. I'm from the other school because I don't like to do things for nothing. I, you know, we spend hours and <laughs> much money on writing content, so I kinda want some kind of bang for my buck. Um, you've obviously heard of the content, uh, the concept called education-based marketing, and that's really what we do, I believe, when we write content. We write content to attract people, that, but then we would like them to get to the, another step in the process. And, and you're absolutely right. A lot of people write content, but they don't have the next step or another call to action. So, we're, and all they need to do is add an extra paragraph with a link or a little button with a link to a white paper to frequently asked questions uh, to a booklet there's there's a whole bunch of ways to get people engaged and as you know um, once people have downloaded a booklet you you get the tire kickers you know the guys that go into the uh, car dealership and just kick tires but why would someone waste their time and download go an extra step and download something else if they it wasn't some kind of interest and if I could use an example uh, in the estate agents world you know I don't know how it happens in your country but in, in South Africa estate agents tend to uh, they got a lot of branding they got a lot of advertising out and you tend to find their faces on the dustbin because they advertise on the on the, on the dustbins there which I, I says I, I think is not really the greatest place to put in your face <laughs> but evidently it seems to work but then the big five estate agents in the area you know they get someone looking for a house uh, their, their biggest challenge is not finding buyers it's finding houses to sell so I thought of an idea and I don't even know it was, if it was my own idea but it, it uh, I probably through osmosis got it but imagine writing a booklet that said are you making these seven house hunting mistakes and then put the booklet an ebook for free and then advertise in the local paper where the, your prospect would be and say listen if you are afraid of making house hunt, hunting mistakes why don't you send us an email and we'll send you this booklet yeah now what happens as you know you get an email address and probably you get a telephone number so then you send the booklet with these house hunting mistakes but that says to me that the person that's downloaded the booklet is probably interested in looking is interested in looking for a house. Yeah. And what I would then do as the salesperson, I would phone them two or three days later and say something like, "Hey, you downloaded the booklet. Have you read it? And I'm assuming that you you're in the market for looking for a house." And the person would hopefully say yes. Now that's a that what I would say would be a hot referral based on education based marketing and and kind of an ideal model. And and you, as you, it's in South Africa, it's not happening as much as probably overseas. Um, we're not getting that second step where we engage them more, and then the third step where we engage them more. In fact, and I've done it as well, so I'm guilty of it. We want to close the deal first shot. We we want to send out an email uh, to a, in my case, to a seminar, and I send it out to a lukewarm, cold, warm database. And I'm hoping to get a lot of people, but as you know, it doesn't work like that in real life. You've got to send out an email and then have a second step where they download something, and that's when you only start fighting for the business. But as you probably know, three percent of people will probably, if you're lucky, will buy on the first send. But you've got to get them going. Um, there's sixty odd percent of people that have a need, but they don't know that they have the need yet. So you can then educate them through um, your booklets, through your internet marketing, through testimonials and case studies. But I think in South Africa, particularly, we still want to hit first shot and get the deal. But we don't have the stamina or the patience for 
the longer sales cycle. So it's you know it might take a couple of weeks longer, but then you bed down that sale and really close it. Exactly, and that's a, that's a very good point uh, for for closing here for, for now anyway. Uh, be, because essentially what you're talking about is what, what I call sex on the first date uh, when I speak about these things and it is true and we, and we make this mistake over and over again and not just in South Africa I see that everywhere there's only a few uh, marketers who, who are really getting it uh, who are seeding uh, non-promotional content weeks or months prior to when they actually want that important uh, call to, uh, they want to put in that important call to action of sign up for the seminar now, right? Uh, most people hear about, for example, a seminar the first time when it's promoted very heavily, isn't that right? Whereas the, I think, the, 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 right, the right thing to do, but it requires resources, it requires better planning. Uh, many probably feel they don't have the time but um, it, it does require that you create some content that is uh, add, adding value to the recipient, but also is relevant to whatever that particular seminar is, uh, is all about. I just have two quick questions for you uh, before we, uh, uh, we close this uh, first, at least for us, first Google Plus Hangout. Uh, the first thing is, uh, what's your thoughts on what you talked about earlier? Uh, what do we need to do in order to get the marketing function and the sales silo to work better together? All right. Well, that's a that's a whole another hour discussion. <laughs> but we we have to, I believe, we have to have a culture of sales and marketing that are together, not a culture that they are two separate entities, because. The way we see marketing, or in my opinion, is marketing generates the leads and salespeople then go and close them. That has been the, I think, the model. Uh, so, so marketing does the, the lead generation and brings them to the salespeople and then the salespeople close them. I think the two are intermingled and intermarried now. Marketing can also close leads because sometimes the guy doesn't want to, or the prospect doesn't want to jump through more hoops. Sometimes the prospect is hot, they want the deal now. And then we still want to put them through another process, but there's, I don't believe there's an easy answer at the moment. I think that that marketing and sales have to become one silo. So the the leaders that they that they then choose to run this need to be both experts in marketing and in sales, and need to under, need to understand both cultures, and need to be able to to navigate that ship through the waters. Because at the moment there's a definite rift between marketing and sales, and also, <laughs> quite honestly, people don't understand what marketing is. I know a lot of the the bigger companies they they in South Africa once again they're very sales focused. They, it's it's visceral, it's blood and guts. They can see the sales guys are going out there, they're getting hammered, they they're doing the deals or they're not doing the deals, but at least they're trying. Marketing. The, I think many companies are still battling to see the, I suppose, the ROI of marketing, um, particularly in the new marketing where it's internet marketing and social media. I mean, I must go to a sales manager and say, you know, well, you need to write articles. He's going to say, what for? I mean, my guys are going to go knock down doors. And I can see yeah. there's, actually, there's actually activity happening. So, yes, I know I need a LinkedIn page, but it's not important. Sorry, we've got a, a bull terrier. Can you hear it? Bull terrier attacking yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're just trying to get it quiet. Someone's running to. It's probably eating somebody, as bull terriers do. <laughs> um, and it made me lose my train of thought. But uh, Africa, as I say, is not for sissies. <laughs> so, yeah. So I believe that a lot of C, a lot of CEOs. Um, sales directors have not quite grasped what marketing can do. You know, they don't want to know that we can increase your sales by 1% because that maybe means nothing to them. They want to see the 10, 20% increase. But as you and I know that a 1% to 2% increase over a mass market can be a fortune uh, in terms of money. But, uh, yeah, so I don't think we, we're there yet. I think we... It, it, it's a culture thing, and at the moment there's two cultures fighting each other. 
as I said, marketing is seen as the sexy guys that uh, the propeller heads that come up with concepts, but they don't have. They've got no money in the game. They're not the ones that are going out there and invest every day. And Collins, uh, you know, you've got your generals and your colonels coming up with a strategy, uh, which is the marketing strategy in this case. But then you've got your real soldiers getting hammered on the front, and they're the ones that actually know what's going on on the coalface. So they, it's like, I suppose, if you ever saw the movie Rambo, you know, there's always this non-commissioned officers against the, the generals, because the generals can, with one sweep of a decision, kill 100,000 troops, yeah. where the non-commissioned officer is the one taking the hits. So they, they, they intensely dislike each other. They don't trust each other. And I kind of think, maybe not as dramatically, but marketing and sales have that same call. They don't trust each other yet because I don't think they understand each other yet. Exactly. So the the, the last question I, I have, Shaq, for now anyway, we can probably do another talk some uh, some other day. Um, sure. the, the last question I have is, uh, you know, at the beginning of our talk, we were, you were mentioning quantities. And I think there's a tendency to focus way too much on the quantity of leads and not enough on the quality of leads. What do you think uh, sales and marketing can do in order to move focus away from quantities and start focusing more on the quality of the leads and the timing of which the lead is sort of carried from, the mark from being a marketing lead to uh, being a sales lead? In other words, to make sure that that timing is... is uh, as good as possible so that sales are working with with qualified leads where a need is established and uh, where they may just where they may be in, in the second phase of the research phase yeah absolutely Michael the the, ch the challenge we have is that it in many cases it takes time to develop this lead nurturing process and I think many companies aren't skilled at that they you know, they kind of put out an advert, hope they get something, a quick win or two, but they're not prepared to, to maybe take the six months that it's going to take to actually bed this deal down and do it. Now, the chat, so, so marketing has a challenge. I think marketing needs to change the way they, they nurture needs and then send quality leads off to the salespeople because I think what's happened is we just we get a lead, we send it off to the salesperson, and then the person has to go and 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 try and close that lead. But here, this sales environment, the big challenge. Is that that you have to nurture here that hey, I've sent you out to see fifteen people this week. I want three deals out of that or four deals out of that. Yeah, and the reality on the ground is that that's not happening. And in South Africa, if we, in any case, I'm not sure how it works in the rest of the world. But if we employ a salesperson, we give them three months probation. If they haven't like really gone amazingly gangbusters and sold amazingly, they get fired. Yeah. This is the reality in South Africa. In my what I try and do in my consulting, I say <laughs> you've got to give the guy at least a year, six months to a year before you start making those calls on whether they get fired or not. Because it, it takes almost that long just to, to learn the culture and, and the company. Uh, and also, it, it, I just have a realistic uh, ex expectation of how quickly it close or how long it takes to close a proper deal. I'm not talking about uh, something at a show where you can buy a special piece of equipment that can cut bread quickly. You know, it's forty dollars. You can make a decision on that easy. I'm talking about the bigger deals. Yeah. Um, in fact, I remember you mentioned it in one of your in one of the talks I heard you give in, when you were over in South Africa. Something about the rule of five. It takes five times longer than you actually think it's going to take for anything to happen. And I think that's the reality. It takes five times longer to close a deal than we actually think. And yes. That uh, so we need. I think I'm thinking we need a more sophisticated marketer than we had in the old days. Someone yes. that actually how to do this stuff, how to nurture leads, 
and not just generate them. And we also need a more patient sales manager that's going to allow the salesperson to make to find their feet. But I don't believe salespeople can find their feet in three months. I believe it's a six months to a year process. And of course that presupposes <laughs> that you've chosen the salesperson properly. I mean, it's very easy, and I'm going a bit off track now, but it's very easy uh, to, to see if someone's not going to make it quickly. You can do it quickly. Um, but some people that have got the potential to make it, but you've got to give them a chance to breathe and to, to build that potential. And those are the kind of, we need, we need long, long periods of time to, I suppose, to nurture the needs. But the expectation is, hey, you see a person, you give a proposal, you close. If you don't close, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and I think, I think we need to start taking a step back and saying, listen, let's do a benchmark. Take it over six months. How quickly does it take to close a lead? Because often companies have a totally unrealistic expectation of lead generation. So I'm saying is, I suppose to end the session, is hey, marketing and sales need to get together. They need to form a one silo. They need to have the same culture. They need to understand each other. And we need to start doing education-based marketing more than we are at the moment. And getting people to go through the and, and And you are obviously an expert at that, but set goals for each step so that we know where we're heading. Um, and then, of course, for not to hammer salespeople and fire them within three months because they haven't closed all the deals that you wanted them to, have a realistic expectation and give them more of a chance to get down and become really good at what they do. And yeah, that's, I think that's my take on it for today. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Shaq. And let me just uh, yeah, <laughs> wrap up uh, here. So here's Michael Leander. If you've been watching all the way to the end here, I've had a, a great conversation with Jacques de Villiers. Uh, we'll put some links uh, close by where, wherever you're watching this particular recording where you can get in, uh, in touch with Jacques. And if you'd like to talk to him about uh, lead generation or if you'd like to talk to him about lead conversion or if you'd like to talk to him about sales training, he's a professional speaker. He, he is based in South Africa, but he speaks everywhere. Uh, in the world. Uh, as I said before, I met him actually in Iran where he and I were speaking at a conference. Uh, watch his blog and uh, also watch mine. We'll try to cover some more lead generation borderline into sales and sales management on the, on the blogs in the near future. So thank you for watching. I wish you a great day today and all the other days. Thanks a lot, Jack. Oh, thank you, Michael, and thanks for the opportunity to share some knowledge.